be with you. But I'd like to start with some questions. These are questions that I've been thinking about over the last couple of years, and I want to share with you where I'm up to on that learning journey and what I'm finding out. So the first question is one really that Bruno was just mentioning. Can you really do personalization in a residential care home? Can you really change things and make sure that people with dementia have got more choice and control in their lives without any extra resources, with staff on minimum wage, and with a time and task culture? What do you think? Are, are we on a, a, anybody saying yes? Do you think that's something that we can do pretty easily? Yeah, anybody? No, don't think that could be done? No, not sure's? Not sure's? Okay, so the not sure's have it. So um, I want to share how far we've got with that and what we've been learning um, together. So can we do it? This is what we're aiming towards. So I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey. And one of the things that he says is begin with the end in mind. So these are the definitions of what a good individual service fund looks like. Now, individual service fund is simply the jargon for what it's like if you're using a personal budget um, with a provider. So the provider holds the money on your behalf and spends it in the way that you want it to be spent. Now, I'm sure you know that the government is piloting direct payments at the moment in residential care, and these will be the same criteria of success used there as well. So can people have a service when they can do what they want, where they're supported where they want to be? Uh, when they can choose the staff who supports them, when they get exactly the support they want, when they want it and where they want it and how they want it, and can they be a central part of decision-making as well. So this is where I've been learning um, this stuff. This is Bruce Lodge, where 43 people with dementia live at the moment. It's in Stockport, which is my hometown. And this is Winifred. I first met Winifred four months ago. Um, I was there quite early in the morning and Winifred was coming out of her bedroom smiling. My colleague Jill was there as well and Winifred said hello to me and asked me how my brother was. I don't have a brother, but that's how, how Winifred greets people. When Jill first met Winifred, when we started this work, Winifred was crying at the gates of Bruce Lodge asking whether she could get out and crying for her mother. Behind her, a bit further back, at the doors of Bruce Lodge, was her daughter, Bernie, who was also crying as well because she was so awful to see her mother so distressed. So Winifred's in, in a different place now. But before I tell you how we started to do that, I want to go back two years. So, so this is a group of people that I was working with at Dimensions, which is one of the largest providers of services for people with learning disabilities. And we were trying to achieve the same key statements that I showed you a few minutes ago with six people um, who have learning disabilities who live together in residential care. And we went through a similar journey. And it was a very proud moment for me when we launched this book at NCAS um, last two years ago. I was just having a chat with Brona and Catherine about the advantages still of having free books rather than just Kindles. So I was very proud of sharing this free book with people and feeling pretty pleased with myself. Has anybody seen this? Oh, thank you. Two people have. <laughs> I'll give you my email address at the end. If you want a complimentary copy as a result of coming today, just email me and I'll put one in the post. Do you know who this guy is? David Bean, yes. So this is David Bean, and at the time, David Bean was the Director General um, for Adult Social Care. And David burst my bubble in a very significant way. He said, that's great, Helen. He said, that's great that you can introduce individual service funds with six people who live together. Come back and see me when you do it with 20. So that then became my personal challenge to see if we can use those same principles um, with people who live together in bigger groups. We're in quite a lot of competition with people who sound like they've got a bigger mic than I have yeah. next door. So uh, please let me know if you can't hear me and I'll endeavour to speak a bit louder. So this is what we've been learning together. How can we change things for the individual? And in this case, Winifred. What does it mean for staff? If we're really going to change the way staff works with individuals, what does that mean for the staff's experience? And what does it mean for the local service as well? So this was the group that I was working with. Um, a third of the group members there are people from Stockport Council. So we had the commissioner in the room with us and we had the head of quality as well. The organisation that we're working with is called Borough Care Limited and they have about 10 care homes. But in the room with us there is Lisa, who's the manager. And in, in Stephen Covey's style, we start off by saying, what would success look like? What are we aiming for? 
What are we trying to achieve? This is the process of developing individual service funds. It's the same process that the um, direct payment budget pilots will hopefully be using over the next three months. It has to start with allocation, and that means that you know how much money you've got or how much time you've got. Then the plan or the support planning process is about making the decisions about how you want to spend your money or time. That should be recorded somewhere in a contract or an agreement. We then put it into practice. We learn about what's working and what's not working, and we review it through a person-centered review. I know it's really embarrassing, isn't it, when the only seats are at the front, but welcome. Come and, come and join us. So the very first thing we had to do at Bruce Lodge is work out what people's allocation was. And this is where the manager uh, practically started going grey because we said, how much out of existing resources, because Stockport Commissioner's bottom line was, this can't cost any more money. You have to make this happen within existing resources. So we said to Lisa and the team, how much individual time do you think you can guarantee for every person each month at Bruce Lodge? Now, when we did this with Dimensions, with the six people who uh, use learning disability services there, their individual allocation was between sort of 15 and 18 hours per week. The most that Bruce Lodge thought they could do was two hours a month. Now, when I presented this at a conference uh, last year in November, my colleagues in Learning Disability Services were practically outraged by that and said, well, kind of, what's the point if all you can do is two hours? And I hope that I answer that question by the end of this. My colleagues in Dementia Services were going, wow, could they really do two hours per person on existing services? That's amazing. And that kind of demonstrates to us the difference about where services are in terms of their funding and what's possible. But that's the most that we could do at Bruce Lodge. It was two hours per person per month. So the next thing we had to think about was how can we enable people with dementia and their carers and families to really make decisions about how that two hours could be spent? What kind of planning process would be proportionate here? And this, this is what we did. We used person-centered thinking tools, which are just a different way of having a different conversation and recording it differently. So some of the questions are, what does a good day look like for you? And what does a bad day look like for you? And if the person can't tell us themselves, then either the staff who know the person very well or their family should be able to tell us. Now, I've only met Brona for about 10 minutes and she was telling me about her mum. And what you're effectively telling me is a bad day for your mum is when she's been dressed in mis mismatched clothing. Green top, red trousers or red skirt. And your mum displays, although your mum can't tell you directly, she displays that she isn't happy about that by being grumpy. Is that, is that right? So, very grumpy. Very grumpy. So, so that's the kind of information that we want together. What makes a really good day? And for your mum, it's having coordinated clothes and feeling presentable. And what makes a bad day? Clothes all over the place, not feeling uh, proud of the way I look. Um, if I could, I would. Now, it's really easy for us to think about people as dementias automatically towards the end of their life. And they, how can we talk about what people's dreams and aspirations could be? We don't quite go as far as dreams and aspirations, but the way that we phrase it is, if you could do anything with an extra two hours a month and somebody support you to, to go out of the home or do something differently here, what would you do? Now, Winifred couldn't tell us directly, but Winifred's two daughters were there and they said, you know, before mum came to Bruce Lodge, what she loved doing more than anything was keeping her home beautiful. She is a real homemaker. She would sing while she was cleaning. She would love to create a really hospitable and gorgeous place for people to, to be in. And we'd also ask the family and the individual what's working and not working from the individual's perspective, and that they can't tell us, it would be our best guess, and from your perspective as well as family members. And then you can see in the boxes underneath that, this is where we recorded that information. Now that meeting took about an hour and we got quite a lot of information from that. So from that we could put together Winifred's one-page profile. Now a one-page profile is simply one sheet of paper with three headings. It says what do we like and admire or appreciate about the person, um, what's important to the person from their perspective 
and how does the person want to be supported. I don't think we stand any chance of delivering personalised services unless we know this information. How can we personalise what we're offering unless we know what matters to people? How can we personalise services unless we know exactly how they want to be supported? So for me, a one-page profile is the foundation stone of any attempt to personalise services. This is Winifred. The other thing we learnt is, is about how Winifred communicates, because most of us communicate non-verbally, even if we do use words to speak, more powerfully than anything else. I have three teenage daughters. I feel very blessed by that, but I know when Ellie's had a bad time, because when she comes home, the door's more likely to slam, and I can hear her bags being thrown downstairs. With Kate, I know if she's having a bad time, because she says nothing to us. She just looks grumpy and grunts and says nothing. And I'm sure if you've got kids, you know how they're feeling without them having to say, I feel happy or I feel sad. People with dementia have lots of different ways of telling us how they're feeling and what they're communicating. For your mum, it was being grumpy. For Winifred, she's got lots of different ways of communicating. We need staff to understand that and understand what people are telling us with their behaviour as well as their words. This is Winifred's working, not working, and it captures our best guess from Winifred's perspective because she couldn't tell us directly, but also what's working and not working from the family's perspective as well. And if I could, I would. As I said before, Winifred couldn't tell us directly, but the family said she would love to be cleaning here and tidying up and feeling like she was making a difference and making a contribution. What we did with that information I think is arguably the, the very different thing that we try to achieve together. Because you might be thinking, well, you know, we, we've got good care plans. You know, if, if you look through our 15 pages, you could find some of that information. I think there's a real strength to having it on one page. But what we did next was to say, in terms of Winifred using her two hours, it's not just what you do, but it's who supports you to do it as well. Something that's very exciting is happening <laughs> So we asked every staff member, and that include the housekeepers and the handymen and the people in admin and the managers, as well as the staff, to do their own one-page profiles. So we could learn what staff appreciated about each other. We could learn what mattered to people outside their time at work and how best to support them at work. Now Beryl, and this is Beryl's one-page profile, is the housekeeper. So we thought that the best person to support Winifred to, um, to clean and tidy up was Beryl. So for Winifred's two hours a month, she was matched with Beryl. And what they spend their time doing is folding ironed clothes, tidying up in the kitchen. They had their tea break together as well. If you ever visited Bruce Lodge, you'd probably find Winifred with a cloth wiping down the rails and singing to herself as well. Now, this isn't an attempt to get cheap labour in Bruce Lodge. This is Winifred doing what matters to her and what she loves doing. Uh, and I'll share in a few minutes the different things that other people are doing as well. Jill took this photograph um, three weeks ago. Jill was at Bruce Lodge at 7 o'clock at night, um, ha finishing having a chat to some staff. And as she left, she turned around and saw Winifred sat in the foyer busily folding clothes and humming as she did it as well. So the next part of the process, and if you see in the corner there, it's agree the plan and then implement, is we had to see what we were learning as we were doing this. So although I've just told you about Winifred, this was happening for every member, every person that was living there. 43 people all wanted to do something very, very different with their two hours. And we wanted to capture what we were learning about that because that was new and different to do. But the progress notes that were currently used at Bruce Lodge captured what people ate, whether there was anything unusual, nothing about what we're learning and trying together. So we introduced something called the learning log that describes what the person did, who was there, what we learned about what worked well, and what we learned about what didn't work well, about what we need to do differently next time. So part of this process is keeping learning both about what we need to change in how we're supporting the person and also what else we're learning about Winifred to update her one-page profile. At the end of this process is a person-centred review. And this is the process that we use for a person-centred review. 
They use it extensively in schools uh, for children with special educational needs. Big organisations like Dimensions are introducing them for everybody that they support on an annual basis. After this meeting, I'm going to meet the Scope executive team, and they're looking at rolling out person-centred reviews for everybody that they support as well. For people um, with, with dementia, we'll either do it on the wall, as it indicates here, or, or do it around a table, but it's like going back to that first conversation and asking, what's working and not working for Winifred now? What's working and not working from Beryl's perspective as Winifred's relatives? What's working and not working from the staff perspective as well? Is, is this working out for staff too? And this is how we update the one-page profile and keep making changes about how we're working. It takes no more than an hour, but is an hour really well spent in terms of fine-tuning how we're working together. So this is what Bernie says about the difference that this is, has made to a mum that she feels like she's got a purpose. She, feels in, she sees her mum as much, much happier, and she's singing as well. Before we started this process, Winifred was described as somebody who had challenging behaviour. And the reason that her behaviour was challenging was because we weren't paying attention to what really matters to Winifred, and we didn't know what good support looked like for Winifred. And like with your mum, Grumpiness can quickly es escalate to challenging behaviour because we're not doing a good job of listening to what really matters to the person. And you told me, Brenda, that you had to go around and educate all of the staff. That can take time, and you need to be sure that staff will then remember that. But a one-page profile is a way to capture that and keep that information in front of people as well. This is what Maureen, um, uh, Winifred's other daughter says about feeling like a useful member of the community and I think that's probably a very different experience to the way a lot of people with dementia living in care homes might feel. So let me tell you about a couple of other people. Doreen decided that she wanted to use her two hours reconnecting with friends at church um, so she goes to mass every other Thursday but we're now able to start extending that because somebody from church has said, well, do you know what? we could pick Doreen up and, and then Doreen could come every Sunday and not just every other Sunday. So slowly and surely we're finding ways where other people can support us to make sure that people have more and more individual time. And this is May and Chris. Now, May is 84. She challenges my stereotypes of what people living in a care home might want to do because she said, do you know what, I would love to go swimming. I've not been swimming for 20 years. I would really, really love to go swimming again. And surprisingly, Chris said the same. So it made sense to pair them up, although there's none of the other activities that people do. They're paired up with other people. Everybody else experiences them individually. The surprising knock-on effect for us have been how the staff have changed the way they've been working. So we were anxious that all we might be able to achieve is for each month people had two hours of a different experience. And that didn't feel enough, but it felt like a good start. What we were really hoping to do is that staff would be paying attention to people's one-page profiles. On a day-to-day -day basis, they'd be paying attention to what matters to people and how better support them. So people could have more choice, more control, be known by staff who supports them individually. But doing the staff one-page profiles had knock-on benefits as well. So Lisa, if she was here with me, would say, I'm noticing different conversations in the staff rooms. There are different conversations over tea and coffee. Because now that we know more about what matters to each other, it feels like we're closer as a team. She said, and I'm seeing staff going the extra mile. So one of the people um, is paired up with Roy, who's the handyman. And Roy knows that the person he's paired up with loves um, classical music. So Roy went to his, his personal collection of classical music and brought in some extra CDs for the guy to listen to and actually set up the guy with the CDs to listen to every day just while he's doing his handyman work. Another person, um, another staff member, Tracy, loves dogs, walks the dogs every day um, and particularly at the weekends and knows now that somebody she supports also loves dogs. So sometimes she comes and picks up the person to walk the dogs with her as well. 
Now, we didn't think that would happen because this was a, a, a classical care home where people were really focused on getting the medication done, getting the lunchtime done, making sure everybody was up by 10 o'clock and had very much a task and time culture. But we're seeing that change and people start to do things differently. Uh, some of you might have heard my colleagues from Lancashire County Council who were on before me. They're commissioners for Lancashire and they've got an expectation that everybody in a care home uh, before too long will have a one-page profile. Their agenda is safeguarding. They don't think we can provide a safe way to support people unless we know how people want to be supported and that that's communicated really clearly with one-page profiles. Sky, the Social Care Institute for Excellence, have been developing a free resource for staff. So in September, you'll be able to go online, and it's a free electronic resource where staff members can go online and develop their own one-page profile um, and be able to print that out to share with people at work. And the premise behind that is that Sky thinks if staff do their own one-page profile, that's the best way to learn about one-page profiles, and they then might be able to create more with the people they support. Last year, um, I was lucky enough to be asked to go and evaluate um, a, a, a flagship care home for people with dementia down south. Um, if you wanted your relative to go to this care home, it would cost you about £1,500 per week. Um, so I was asked to go and have a look at it. And it's the most beautiful buildings. And they invited me to go for lunch. And I sat and had the kind of meal that I'd have in our local restaurant. Three courses, silver service, sat alongside other people um, who've got dementia um, as well. And we were shown round. And as I was shown round, it was about four weeks before Christmas. And the people who lived there were doing some cutting and sticking activities. And they were creating Christmas decorations uh, to go on the wall. Although a staff member whispered to me, she said, but you know what, the managers don't like us sticking them on the wall. They don't think they look good enough. One of the things that we've been doing at Bruce Lodge is we've taken everybody's one-page profile to say what activities can we do as an activity program um, as well as people going out um, and having two hours a month. And of course, that's, that's typical and great practice in care homes. But rather just imagining that what we could do, bingo, cutting, act, cutting and, and craft activities, we did an analysis of what was important to everybody and said, which ones of these can we do as an activity together so at least people are doing the things that are important to them and actually the things that other people might like to try rather than just things that we imagine. Out of those 43 people, nobody had cutting up coloured bits of paper <laughs> and making craft things from them. And I'm not really surprised, actually, because one of the people with dementia that I spoke to at this very prestigious home said, do you know what, I feel like I'm back at school. And the staff were doing that with the best will in the world, with the resources available to them, but not focusing on what matters to people and what, who they are and what reflects what's important to them. So I think both one-page profiles can help us make sure people are getting the support they want the way they want to pay attention to people as individuals and recognise what matters to them from their perspective, both to support individual time and also where we're doing group activities to make sure they work for people as well. So I said to the manager of this very, very prestigious um, home, how do you make sure that people have got individual time where they're really supported to do what matters to them? And he kind of inferred that because the staffing ratio was so good, that would happen automatically. But it didn't. When we did a person-centred review with one of the, the individuals who lived there, it was really clear that they'd not managed to get that right. So I think we need the kind of intentional effort that Bruce Lodge are doing. Say, actually, if we could only give somebody an hour, but that hour was something that they really wanted to do with a staff member that they'd either chosen themselves or had been matched to them because they share the same interest, then that's so much better than we've done before. And this is a journey of a 1,000 miles. And this is a single step. So if you go out of here thinking, really, two hours a month, is that it? But for Winifred, that made a huge difference. For Doreen to meet up with her friends from church again, that was a huge difference. For May to go swimming again, that really mattered to her as well. And you know what? I could never afford £1,500 a week for my mum, if my mum had dementia. But even if I could, I'd want her at Bruce Lodge, not this other place. Because very, very 
beautifully designed homes with hotel services wear thin. What really matters is great relationships, feeling like you're known, feeling like you're an individual, being appreciated for who you are and being supported in the way that matters to you. So this, this is what the Dementia Declaration says. And this is my perspective about how some of these person-centered thinking tools can help us deliver them. Because I don't think people can have personal choice and control and influence decisions unless we know what matters to people through one-page profile, unless we know how people communicate, unless we're listening to what's working and not working for people through person-centered reviews, and there are other person-centered practices called decision-making agreements as well. We can only design or tailor services around people if we know what matters to them, like through a, person, like a one-page profile. And working together for change is where you can take information from all 43 people who live at Bruce Lodge and say, what's everybody telling us that's working about the services we're trying to deliver and not working about the services that we're trying to deliver so we can inform our business plan? People want to have a sense of belonging and feel valued and a part of a family, community and civic life. And now what we're looking at at Bruce Lodge is community maps and relationship circles and ways that we can help people to be members of the community as well. And we can only get right the support that people want in their day-to-day -day life if we know what that looks like for each person through a one-page profile. So if you're thinking, well, that's lovely, Helen, but I don't know how to get started. Oh, thank you very much. Here, my glamorous assistant is, uh, is showing you this. This, um, this was, was developed by uh, providers and commissioners and academics um, around dementia as well. And it's simply a self-assessment so that you can know where you're starting from. And it'll give you some ideas about what you want, might want to do next. Um, I've got 10 free copies. So if you want to have a copy, um, come and get one uh, before the end. But also if you want to email me for a copy, I'll put a hard copy in the post to you or the other book that I mentioned as well. And if you're thinking, yes, but didn't that cost 20 days training and £50,000 in consultancy fees? No, it didn't. It was two half days training for staff around one-page profiles. And it was coaching the manager and staff to get that embedded. So it wasn't taking people away for lots and lots of training. It was doing on-site coaching. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm only just on time, but I really appreciate uh, you coming and listening to this session. And I hope that you might be inspired to explore one-page profiles or to have a go at looking at this. But most importantly, making sure at least an hour a month counts differently for people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, it's lovely to see lots of smiles and nods in an audience during a presentation. It's really good. I think we can sneak in one or two very quick questions, if you've got any. Oh, apparently you've answered everything. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helen. It was a great presentation. Oh, OK, very quickly, the lady at the front, if we can get a microphone to you. Just a moment. Just, just hang on one moment, please. Helen, my name is Maria. Um, I'm uh, helping a dementia lady actually alzheimer which is much worse than we expected and um, she's from ethnic minority uh, her condition is she remembers the old days but not the present she was uh, here in uk for over 40 years and after having the condition she doesn't communicate with her children. The children doesn't speak Cantonese. She remember the old days when she was in uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and China. And she refuses to answer, you know, anything spoken in English. Can I, can I just so the children find it extremely difficult and they didn't have anywhere they could find help. Have you thought of your, you know, care, you know, or at homes that might suit for, you know, uh, ethnic minorities like her? 
Absolutely. So, so what's important to you includes your culture, your religion, anything that matters to you gets captured on a one-page profile under that section as well. And if we don't have relatives around us that can tell us what matters to the person, if the person can't tell us themselves, we have to be like detectives. So if, if somebody has a record of their history, then it's about saying, what does this person's history tell us about what might still matter to them now? And how can we use things like learning log to test out whether we're right or not? Because I wouldn't want people assuming that everything in my history is still important to me, but it might give clues about what's important um, now. So, so it's about using that kind of approach to start to complete a one-page profile. I think we're going to be told we run out of time, but I'm I, really happy to carry on that conversation outside I if you'd we, like to. Oh yeah, okay. unfortunately we Thank are you now very out of time. Much. Thank, Thank you, you again, Helen. That was great. There you go. Wait, right. Here we go. It's going to be... Right. Press. I feel like 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 I